Uh, hello, good evening. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's great to see so many people interested in flowers. Um, so I'm Ben Raskin. I'm the head of horticulture at the Soil Association. Uh, I'm also uh, on the board of the Organic Growers Alliance, and this is a, a webinar that's being co-run by the two organisations. Uh, the Soil Association is a membership charity uh, that campaigns for healthy, humane uh, and sustainable food farming and land use. Uh, and we're obviously we also certify uh, organic businesses and others. Uh, the Organic Growers Alliance is a network of growers uh, and horticulturalists and farmers. Uh, it's, it's run by growers for growers. There's a great forum and a great magazine. And uh, Jim Apfin is also, I believe, on the call and he's another board member of the OGA. So uh, do join if you're interested at all in that. It's well worth it. So tonight's webinar really was prompted by COVID um, and by the fact that uh, it appears that flower growers uh, have been harder hit and flower sellers harder hit than vegetable growers. Um, I know there was a question from one of you about what evidence there is for that. And we certainly it would be really good to understand a bit more about how how that's played out. But certainly uh, talking to people, we believe that, that flower growers have been harder hit. And we wanted really to do something just to bring people together to support each other and look for new ideas and new opportunities. Um, and it builds on a uh, an organic flower conference that the Organic Growers Alliance held pre-COVID. Um, and we, I mean, we'd certainly like to do more of these, probably some more technical webinars perhaps uh, as follow-ups, but tonight we are going to concentrate more on the market and market opportunities. Uh, we had planned three speakers for you. Um, unfortunately for us, although Fortunately for her, Fiona had a last minute wedding uh, booking that meant that she couldn't join tonight. She did record a, a little interview for us, but technology has failed us and we can't get it to play. Uh, so unfortunately we are without Fiona in any form tonight, uh, but we are going to try and make sure that that interview is uh, on the recorded version so that you can catch up with what Fiona said. Uh, however, uh, you know, every cloud has a silver lining so it means we get more of Joe and more of Jill tonight uh, and they're, so they're going to sort of expand slightly on on what they're going to cover uh, so Dr Jill Timms we're going to we're going to start with she's uh, her current focus of research is on uh, the ethical consumerism in horticultural supply chains and, and in particular the cut flower industry uh, she's got masses of experience, so she's going to set the scene for us, uh, both UK but globally, and, and sort of set it up in that way for us. So over to you, Jill. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. So I am going to take my 15 minutes since we have a little bit of extra time. It's very good to be able to see some of you. Um, I'm delighted that there is this interest in sustainable flowers. And I, as has been spoken about, I have been researching this area, um, not just flowers, agricultural supply chains. However, the big project we have at the moment at Coventry University is on um, cut flowers. So there's about four things I'd like to do in the time that I have. Firstly, um, I am just going to Give a bit of a background as to what research we've been doing and why it might be of interest to you. Um, then secondly I'd like to set a bit of the global scene for the discussion that we're having, the wider context of the cut flower sector. Um, and then as the title I've got there which I hope you can see, um, look at some of the challenges in the global supply of cut flowers because I really think that it's that global challenge that have arisen that provide you with some opportunities, local chances. Okay, so um, I will move this on. Um, it's been a little bit slow. We have done some practicing, however, bear with us and I can continue to share with you um, what I want to say whilst this is going on as well. And there we go. Okay. 
Okay, so that's coming along. So what have we um, been doing and what are we interested in and what are we actually doing to do that? Few questions there. So in giving an overview of our work, you know, if we're talking about sustainable flowers, I'm an academic based at Coventry University. Um, of course, definitions are always key. But one of the things that we're interested in this area is that, of course, what we mean by a sustainable flower, what a sustainable flower looks like, can be very different for different people. So that's one of the things that we're trying to look at, what it means to people. Certainly, there's the environmental aspect, which links very much to the organic growing. There's also the social impact. Um, and the social element of a supply chain for flowers. Who is it that's been affected for the better or for the worst? And also this ethical element as well that a lot of people talk about. Is what we're doing fair and to who? So that's one of the things that we're interested in. How are we doing this? Well, we're certainly not doing it on our own. Um, we are doing this with international partners and funders. We have a number of these um, part of our projects going forward and we're very fortunate to have had funding from a good range of um, people such as the British Academy, Levy Hume Trust, um, the World Wildlife Fund um, and the list goes on and we're trying to increase it all the time of course as well. And our international partners include other academics, um, University of Amsterdam have been fantastic, um, but also University of Newcastle in New Zealand, we have a partner there as well, um, as well as plenty of NGOs and employer organisations and farming organisations in the UK as well. So a couple of the pictures there. Um, at the bottom, you can see my colleague David Beck, he sat next to me in the sort of flowery dress, if you can see that, I hope so. Um, but we have actually been trying to draw together the different stakeholders involved in flower supply chains. So this would include the growers themselves, international and local ones, plus also it would include the agencies and certification bodies such as Fair Trade, within flowers MPS and a number of other ones, ethical trading initiative, for example, plus florists themselves. We have Colin um, sat there in the middle from um, a big events florist in London. We have Angela, who I think is on the call as well, Angela Colton from Petal and Twig, who is also a member of Flowers and the Farm. And Brian at the left side there is the chair of the British Florist Association, who we've been working with. So what have we actually been doing? Well, we've been doing a lot of data collection, speaking to florists up and down the country, as far as the Hebrides um, at one point in time, going to lots of flower related events. So international trade, um, trade fairs, as well as Chelsea and um, other local things. Um, but we've also been running these key stakeholder workshops and you can see a photo from one of our first ones there. We've done that in, um, in several places around the country and also in Amsterdam. And the discussions there are trying to bring together people within the supply chain that don't usually get to meet each other. Sort of, um, it might be NGOs, so we have a wonderful one called Women Working Worldwide, um, who wouldn't always get to talk to people from the, um, from the supermarkets or people from the wholesalers and the packing departments and all these types of things. And we get people together in the same room so that people can share the challenges and the issues from their perspective and start to understand and build those dialogues up. We've also been providing some educational resources and I'll come back to that um, towards the end because I'd like to share those with you too. Um, and farm visits that can be in the UK, which one of the pictures is there of a, a Northwest um, flower farm. Um, and we're doing quite a bit of work in East Africa 
Kenya in particular and the photo in the middle there is um, Valentine's Day which I was um, had the privilege of being in Lake Navasha in Kenya um, on Valentine's Day last year talking to 22 different farmers um, farm leads from fair trade farms in in, Co in um, not Coventry in Kenya okay so um, I must put the acknowledgements up there because this is absolutely not just my research. So on the film, as well as I hope now you can see the acknowledgements to all the people there who have been taking part in this. So the second thing I wanted to do was to set this wider context. And here, eventually it will come up for you, I'm sure. Um, you'll see a global map showing some of the key supply routes that our flowers come from and go to. So you can see that East Africa is an absolute um, core hub, and that's mainly for varieties, particularly roses, but those that need that um, heat to be grown. You can see that in South America, the most majority go to the North American market. We have a growing market in China, um, mainly supplying East Asian countries, but not um, completely. You might also notice that there is a big market in Russia. That's mainly flowers going into Russia. But more than anything, the strongest message is here is that the Netherlands remains the global epicenter for the cut flower industry. Um, in the UK, we get about 90% of our flowers from overseas, and a very high percentage of those um, still go through the Flora Holland and the auction houses in Amsterdam um, and the related ones. So I'm not sure if anyone's ever visited those. Fascinating to do. You can do it as a sort of tourist. I would highly recommend it. Flowers whiz around like a ballet. Um, on these trucks that you can see on that picture, I hope, there. So that gives us an idea of the global nature. It's not everywhere. There are some key supply chains that we are currently utilising. Um, so the third thing I want to just mention is about the global challenges. So what are the key issues that make having sustainable flowers difficult? and what are the barriers to that when it comes to these environmental as well as social and ethical issues. So I'm not going to lecture you, this is um, out of my time, um, I'm not at the university I'm pleased to say, um, but I do think it's helpful to just highlight a few, you might well be aware of some of these, other ones might be a surprise to you, but it's these challenges that I would argue really create opportunities locally because that's an alternative to these. So key ethical challenges at top of the list is in terms of the environmental footprint. So we're talking here in terms of the growing method, the chemical use, but two particular areas always stand out. One of these is the water footprint. So flowers are incredibly thirsty. So that means it's taking water, often from areas and countries that actually are very water poor. So water governance is a big issue. Um, and on top of that, the chemical use within the flower farms also run off to that water supply as well, which again impacts the water, not just the quantity, but also the quality for the local communities. The other environmental impact is from that map, you will probably have seen the carbon footprint. So the idea of flying our flowers in, the distribution centers that are needed is actually hugely significant. Now, just to mention, and I'm sure some of you are aware of this, it's not just a case that we could switch everything to the UK if we want the type of varieties that we currently have. So in some situations, trying to grow things like roses often in greenhouses with the heating systems that are needed can actually increase that carbon footprint compared 
to the methods of flying, which is the way that most of our flowers come from, East Africa, for example. The idea that they fly often to Holland before then going off to another country is something that can be looked at to reduce that. Um, however, it's not just the flying. If you can imagine in these flower farms, um, such as I was on last year, yes, the heat is there to grow the flowers, but as soon as they're cut, they're then put in these absolute freezers and then they're transported through that freight that is temperature controlled. So I was so hot, I was told, you know, put on all this equipment before you go into the freezer to, to see in there. I was really looking forward to being cold, but my goodness, I really did need that um, coat and protective equipment because it really is so cold in there. So we so don't always add that in when we're thinking about it. The third one is the, the sorry, the fourth one is the labor and social issues. So here we have, um, we have issues such as it's very precarious work. Um, people don't always have contracts or they're very um, precarious ones. Possibly pure, pu pu poor health and safety um, issues, discrimination, um, poor infrastructure in companies, in countries, unreliable regulation or how it's enforced. And we've even got um, problems about regional instability. So, for example, Ethiopia had a period of unrest and um, riots, actually, around their flower farms because of the way that land had been given to some of the Dutch companies in particular there that was coming in. And finally, a smaller issue I just want to mention is around floristry practice. And again, this is something we're working on. Often it's because of a lack of training in terms of buying flowers well, in terms of their, um, their ethics, but also the methods that are used in terms of how flowers are transported, the oasis that use the packaging and all those issues. So I just want to point out this picture, if you can see it on the left, is some six foot roses that I once saw from Colombia. You can imagine how unnatural the process of growing those has been. So I'll leave it at that. Moving on to my next slide, I really want to make clear that although I'm talking about these difficulties and challenges, this isn't the case for all farms. One of the ones that I went to last year, um, Redland Roses, had some fantastic examples of environmental and biological um, innovation, such as you see here in terms of using um, certain bugs to be able to monitor um, and improve the quality of the growing um, very naturally. So I'm not saying that this is everywhere, however, I'm saying that there are documented problems. So a response to this has been a massive growth in private regulation, such as certifications, accreditations and standards. Um, many of our flowers might well come with certifications. However, when you buy them in the shops or at florists, you might not be informed about those. And there is a great deal of misunderstanding and lack of information around the certifications. Um, if you can see my screen yet, I've put an examples of quite a few that are relevant to the cut flower market. However, since doing the research, some of these have already failed, other ones have developed. Some of them now have multiple um, um, certifications within them as well. So the final few things that I want to say, watching the time, is that this certification method has its issues when it's not done properly or legally enforced like the Solid Soil Association one is. And there's more questions being asked now about, well, is it a certified flower that is an ethical flower? There's been the impact of Brexit and COVID on in, in, in um, disrupting our supply and more of a move and interest in British and locally grown that would avoid some of the issues that we've been talking about. So final slide here, 
I would say these local chances, these local um, opportunities for expanding our cut flower growing and organic growing within the UK come from ethical consumerism really spreading and more interest in this. Um, even within the trade, you can see there that was from a British Florist Association talk um, around fair trade. So there's growing interest in that. I would always argue that local suppliers are the ones that are best placed to really capitalize on customer relations, trust and security of supply, such as we've seen in the rise of that need because of COVID and potentially Brexit as well. There are support networks being developed, such as lots of people who are on the call today. Um, in particular, I would draw attention to the work of Flowers from the Farm, offering great training initiatives around how to start growing flowers, adding that to um, things that are already being grown, some great sharing of best practice within that. And we're developing novel approaches to how to overcome some of the challenges. So for florists, it's very difficult to know, well, if I have some sustainable flowers, how do I market those to, to my consumers? It's not like a jar of coffee that the label can be stamped on and then it put on the shelf. But we're seeing more personalised labelling. Um, the picture there is from a local one to me called um, Pocket Garden Flowers, where you know the, the label is written saying where they've been grown that people can know about. We also have things about florists being certified, that being a potential where maybe 80% of their um, product would be guaranteed to have grown through certifiable sources. So we have some new and really interesting initiatives that are taking part. I think the last thing I would say is that there are still challenges. I'm not trying to present this as being you know, an open market, go ahead for it. It needs support. It needs to be able to scale up. But I would invite every single one of you to say that you can influence the debate and policies that are going on. We're trying to do that through our research. One small thing to mention, we have now a leaflet um, that we've been distributing, giving a very basic guide to sustainable flowers, which does highlight locally grown flowers. And I'll provide that in our chat um, because it's freely available on our website. I've put our website there as well. And I also have a Twitter account that I update the research on. So I hope I've rattled through that not too quickly. And when it time comes, I'll be very happy to answer any questions too. But thank you for listening. That's great. Thank you so much, Jill. Really, really great introduction. Uh, Kat, are there any specific sort of technical questions on Jill's presentation? Because if not, we'll Nothing, move. No, not in the chat box at the moment, but um, feel free to pop them in there um, and we will that's come to fine. your questions later. That's great. Yeah. So that's, yeah, they're really great uh, scene setting. Um, so we'll move on to Joe. Uh, so Joe Wright, I'm sure many of you already know, runs the fantastic Organic Blooms Soil Association Certified Farm. Uh, it also runs courses um, and is a social enterprise offering training to uh, people with support needs and, and disabilities. So I'll hand over to you now, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for coming uh, to your computers. I can't say coming out on this evening, coming to your computer screens. I've never done one of these online before, so it's quite a challenge. Um, what is brilliant is following Jill, having set the scene so well for for these opportunities, because I'm, I'm yes, there are definitely challenges, but we're very much at the um, opportunities end of the market. Um, so we've been growing cut flowers, myself and Wendy Paul, my um, fellow director, we've been growing cut flowers in South Gloucestershire for about 15 years, building very slowly because we're, it's quite innovative growing them organically. Um, and we are finding year on year that the demand is increasing and the demand for our flowers is increasing beyond what we can supply. So we can actually tell you the good news is there is a market emerging. And I would say it is an emerging market because um, 
there's just not enough supply at the moment. And I mean, and that's the great opportunity. How do we coordinate more growers into the market? Flowers from the Farm, as, as previously mentioned, are a, a wonderful organisation. They're a network of small growers. They certainly have an impact um, on the industry. And in fact, um, I think they might have, we've taken back some market share. I think, Jill, you mentioned that 10% um, of flowers were supplied locally. There's a new statistic out that it might be nearer 14% of, of our supply now is, is in the UK. So there's definitely some impact now from, from small growers. What I'd love to see, there are still some large growers left, um, but we did lose a lot of our, our large growers um, back in the 80s um, at when Holland started subsidising um, their own production. Um, so we lost a lot of um, big growers. I'd love to see them coming back in. And I've got some ideas about that, about helping um, farmers to diversify into cut flowers and increase and, and having a cut flower in their rotation. A cut flower crop in the rotation of a mixed farm could be an amazing way to start really impacting um, on, on the supply chain. Um, so there's so much I could say. Um, are we able, Kat, to get to the next slide, the side with all my little issues on? Um, so obviously we've been doing this um, uh, and evolving gradually year by year. Um, we've been certified organic um, only for three years, actually. We, we were always growing organically, but actually making the step to being certified organic was a bigger step than we actually realised. Um, uh, it was, you kind of think you're organic, but until you actually take that step to certification, it, it did make a difference. It really did. A, a very positive one for us. Um, but obviously, we're very, very into um, kind of moving things forward and the supply chain keeps coming up as one of the kind of the, the supply chain for us um, so at the moment um, we have to be very very self-sufficient I mean growers and organic growers particularly are very used to being self-sufficient but there really is a very limited supply chain for ornamental organics um, we are allowed to derogate, we're allowed to use um, non-organic seed, but obviously we would love to be able to use organic seed. We would love more seed companies to be producing uh, uh, cut flower seed, because obviously you can get herbs, you, and we use a lot of herbs in our bouquets, you can get wildflowers, but you, we really do need a bigger range of cut flower varieties that are certified organic. The seed co cooperative is, is doing a few more this year. So every year I see a few more. Um, and then there's um, the, the perennials and the woody perennials. Obviously, it's, it's quite difficult if you want to scale up quickly. Um, so, that you know, they're not insurmountable issues. They just need a bit of thought. Um, so uh, we are set, we are having to propagate everything ourselves generally. Um, just takes a little bit you you it, you just can't move as quickly sometimes as you'd want to um one of the other issues um is actually a meaningful rotation designing a meaningful rotation when it's just cut flowers um if you don't if you're not doing it within a mixed farm setting or a small holding or a market garden um your flower varieties um they um it's it's strange actually they don't cover as many families as you'd think and it's quite easy to um, build up pests and diseases without even realising it. The flower, you know, ranunculus and anemone, they're a key um, spring flower. They're actually in the same family. So um, it, it is, it, there's a lot of work that could be done on meaningful rotations within cut flower growing. Um, and that leads on massively to the use of green manures. I struggle to use green manures meaningfully as well. Um, because um, we, we try and extend our season right to frost and then you can't establish a green manure. So these are really technical issues. They're probably for another seminar actually, but they're just little um, things that, that make a difference really. The bigger thing that I wanted to chat about, which is um, what Jill has talked about, is really this the supply and the consumer end of things. Um, there's a massive education process needed. Um, I think Jill looked at um, 
replacing a, a, a rose um, grown in Kenya with a rose grown in a greenhouse in the south of England isn't a good swap necessarily. You know, the carbon footprint is just as bad. Um, but actually what we want to do is, is actually provide a, um, an alternative, a sustainable alternative that isn't a rose. Um, we love our roses. We grow a lot of um, English roses, which have a three day um, vase life. And we say to our, our customers, enjoy it for three days. You know, enjoy. there is something about seasonality that we need to get back into the market. You don't need a flower. Um, you, I shouldn't really say this, but you don't need a rose to last two weeks. A, a rose is beautiful for, for three to five days. A sweet pea, everybody accepts it with sweet peas. Um, a sweet pea is beautiful for three days. So I'm not saying that all British flowers only have a three day life, um, a vase life, but there is something about education here, um, consumer awareness, education about a, an alternative flower crop, um, an alternative flower range that are, uh, um, that are, are more sustainable. So I, I think I would probably, we try and avoid replacing, we, we actually try not to grow things um, that are the same as in the supermarket. We try and grow things that are, um, are different and, and more sustainable. So we're not competing on the same kind of territory really. Um, so a critical mass of supply. So we need more growers, we need more supply. There's definitely a market to be, there needs to be a big enough market for people to notice us. So I think this is why we're doing all these conferences and, and why, why OGA are involved, why the Soil Association are involved. It's, it's really trying to entice people to, to start um, thinking about a cut flower crop either within their existing um, kind of farm or bringing new growers in. Um, and as I said, the education element, the consumer awareness about most people actually don't know that cut flowers are a thirsty crop that they have that they've probably got some residual chemicals on that their, their their use of energy is awful with the cool chain supply plus um lighting heating most people don't know it and i think when people do know that they suddenly do think oh maybe i don't want this in my house now we don't want to mark it on a negative we don't want to say you know these are awful you shouldn't be buying them but we do want to be very loud about how good ours are how good um, a British cut flower could be, um, and and you know, but enough of us have to be producing them to for that to be meaningful. So this is kind of what I mean about the critical mass um, of supply, and there has to be a market, um, and that goes alongside the education of the consumer. But we're noticing brilliant, um, discerning customers um, wanting our flowers. People, people are asking more questions. Florists want to buy. We don't sell wholesale very often, but florists want to buy our product. More people are asking for British or, uh, or local or chemical free. Um, and then, and then there's the organic element. Um, pe some people think that's a step too far. Um, there tends not to be a premium, a price premium on the organic flower because the British cut flower is already considered to be a fairly premium crop, the way that we're presenting the British cut flower nowadays. So there's so many small growers um, uh, adding the value in their on their own farms. So there are, there's not so many single species um, uh, bunches around anymore. There's a lot of kind of mixed bouquets um, grown on site. Um, that's already at the high end of the market. So the premium for organic isn't isn't there as much, which isn't a problem because we, we don't we, we just think that's how they should be grown because cut flowers do kind of lend themselves the way we're growing them as a very mixed crop. They lend themselves to being organic anyway. The, the, the choice of species that we have, the, the way we're not doing monocultures, that you you it kind of just makes sense to be organic. <laughs> Um, so the organic, the step to organic, once you're growing a um, uh, hundred varieties, it is not so bad. It kind of just goes hand in hand. So um, there's a lot of growers who are very close to that, very close to being organic, and they they just worry about that next step across to certification. And I, I'd say it's probably the best step we made because it just gives you that discipline and it gives your our consumers. We grow online, we sell online a lot. So our consumers aren't, 
aren't seeing us always and it just gives them that extra um reassurance that that what we're doing is 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 being looked at is being scrutinized so we do love the fact that we've got the certification and it just keeps us disciplined it keeps us always looking at what we're doing and it gives us an interest in developing this whole area as well um i could say more but i'm almost wondering whether it would be worth opening it up for questions now what do you think um ben and kat yeah, I think I think that's great. I think you've sort of brought Jill's overview back down to our UK, you know, grown. And I, what would be really interesting, I think, I think you've sort of set up in a way some of that discussion around certification, perhaps. But but both both the Organic Growers Alliance and the Soil Association are very keen to support not just certified products, but you know, very much about the principles and supporting growers. That are growing to the principles and some as you say some choose to certify and some don't and i'm interested mm. in a way about the opportunities for both of those you mentioned joe that you know often the, the sort of the local bit or the you know the sustainable bit is is enough um but clearly for you you wanted to go that step further do you do you see um either jill or joe do you see that potential for the organic certification does it open up markets that might not otherwise be open even if it's not adding you know value as such or, or, or sort of adding price um does yeah. it still does it allow you to sell to people that might not otherwise have bought totally because the step from buying your vegetables organically to then thinking of your wider lifestyle um is not a big step it um so we're finding that people are just um adding more to their basket really so those who are already shopping online um, if they're used to getting their vegetables organically, they're now seeing that they can get flowers organically. And it, it's definitely a, a different market at the moment, whether it will all merge one day, I don't know. But I, I yes, it de definitely gives us access to a, an extra level of um, customers. Yeah, I would just add to that as well, that I think it's exactly right. There's lots of um, times that we've been presenting things about our research people often said well i do think about it in terms of my tomatoes and where i you know the distance that they've arrived from and things like that never occurred to me about my flowers now i think that's starting to change and i yeah. think once people know about it once it's in people's minds and on their on their radar if you like they're not going to unknow that and we're yeah. also finding that the sort of younger generation there's lots of research that's coming out about um sort of woke capitalism and and how people are using their ethical credentials their ethical sort of principles much more throughout um their buying decisions not just their buying decisions but flowers come to that uh, and i would just add one thing that as a sociologist by background always fascinates me is that flowers are such a particular cultural product that actually we invest so much meaning in them that we give them at times of um, saying sorry or Mother's Day or Valentine's Day to, to actually say something. And when people know and start to understand that some of the choices in delivering flowers could actually be detrimental to the environment or say to a woman who's doing the cutting in um, in Kenya where the chemicals might be causing miscarriages and these types of things that's extreme cases but it, it is documented then actually that gives an extra motivation because of the type of product it is you don't want to be giving that to your mother when yeah. you want it to be actually really clear that this is an ethical product so i think that's something that flowers have even more than some of our other fruit and vegetables that that can be played on some of the very clever campaign groups do do that as well yeah it's something we don't always like to trade on but it's totally you're totally right about it you know why would you give a sick person something with residual chemicals on it or when a baby's born you send them you know it just doesn't make sense but like you say nobody knows it nobody yeah. knows it yeah. um so it's about getting that message out really positively and but i agree about the positive 
yeah, only at the stage where we can provide the alternative. So that's why we've we've been growing and developing our business so slowly because we've been almost waiting for everyone to catch up in terms of yes, we want this product and we've got enough of it to supply you. So yeah. I mean, this the time is right now. I think with all of the things converging, COVID, Brexit, um, the um, people wanting something different and and people wanting authenticity transparency people um i just they want something different um and a story as well i mean we're very lucky we've also got the social enterprise element to our business and, and people will buy um a story as well um and they want they want to know who's who's grown their flowers so it, it kind of works both ways really um so sorry i was just going to say on that positive point and sharing those stories i think is so powerful and it just reminds me of two things that might be interesting to people that a few years ago quite a few years ago now more than 10 years ago there was a campaign in the Netherlands that um, a television campaign that really played on that negative part sort of saying if your dog ate your flowers it could well die you know they really went for that negative and i'm not sure how successful that is in creating this positive market but i think sharing those stories about how they've been grown where they've been grown that mm. that's often the way that fair trade for example um yeah. pr produce things and, and market things as well and just the second small thing was i found it really interesting that there's a couple of european countries that when you talk about ethical flowers they're talking about organic ones germany and to some extent the netherlands as well when yeah. you see certifications on those flowers it's it's all about organic so their awareness of that environmental impact and being used to buying organic is perhaps a little bit further on for them than it is for us so far. Yeah, yeah. At the moment, so, it is the it's the only true way of saying it. I think um, is is to be, and I think that's probably why we went for the certification is because it was the only really true way that we could kind of prove it really, um, other than people coming to visit us and see it for themselves. Great. So there's a there's a point made by Angela on the chat, which says that uh, they're uh, sort of in a way removing some of that choice from from the consumer, and that made me think a little bit about um, the way that box schemes effectively did that for vegetables um, and have been very successful. Um, but also, uh, I know that my colleague um, Sally, who's doing some flowers on their farm with, with Tanya, and they're you know, they're looking at collaborations between growers. So I know, Joe, you said you didn't supply wholesalers because, you know, presumably the margins aren't there for you. Um, but equally, there's there's more market to go at. You know, so mm. are there opportunities? It might be worth bringing Tanya or Sally in or anyone else that, that, that wants to comment on this. But, you know, are there opportunities to work together uh, mm. and a way learn learn from some of that experience of veg boxes to deliver yeah. you know whether it's a weekly bunch of flowers or whatever but you know actually removing the choice yeah. and collaboration as there's sort of uh, opportunities there totally i mean i think there's um the the there's already a hub of british flowers um non organic but um we do supply sometimes to them the a, a british flower hub um, but the, we we could do with um, an organic flower hub and where we all supply into or cooperative or whatever. Um, I think that's how we'll make a bigger impact. And actually, it is really really hard work. We've been doing it, and we know. So we're we're actually supplying about ninety thousand stems a year, ninety thousand to a hundred thousand stems a year. And um, there's something we don't want to be a lot bigger because we like how we are. We like the size we are because we've got a social enterprise as well um and we we won't be we can't grow the industry on our own but we would love to continue to supply into a hub with other growers so that the, the market can grow you know not just through us so there's definitely room i would love that to be the next development really that uh, that growers get together and we we um create the opportunity for for a bigger impact Sally, do you want to um, to just sort of mention what you're doing on that? Assuming that, yeah, yeah there we go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yes, I mean we're we're very small. It's not me. It's Tanya. Um, 
we're organic farm um, and Tanya's taken over an acre or so of the farm um, to grow cut flowers. It is certified. Um, everything is grown to organic standards, uh, not necessarily sold with an organic label on at the moment, but raised to full organic standards. Um, and I think our problem now in growing or Tanya's problem in growing is one person, small business, lots of potential in the area um, and how we might work with other small growers in the area who maybe even just want to grow one type of flower and um, to support her um, with her demand because there's only her and she can only grow so much and she has to demand and it's yeah. really reaching out to others on a regional local basis um, to pull in and even tell local growers what she wants grown mm. what type uh, she wants grown to almost a bit like a contract grower in the arable world to actually yes. specify yeah. exactly what's going to be grown and delivered for a fair ethical price um, but therefore involve others in the growing and reduce the risk as well yeah it's exactly how we're thinking because we've done it all ourselves for years and we do it's, it's hard work but we'd love to share that because there's so much room in the industry um but we it is it's hard doing a you know a 35 weeks of flowers even our courier says are you still doing it <laughs> you know so we we supply from like march to um frost um every five six days a week and the continuity of supply working out continuity of supply for that is so hard <laughs> i i'm not um, i don't i'm not crying about it but we we could we could do more we're not meeting the, the you know the market demand so i think we've got to get together and make it a bit easier actually for for ourselves Yeah, I was just going to add that I think that collaborative approach is absolutely the way to go um, because of the nature of the product again, being able to work together. And if we're able to really raise awareness about seasonality too, it's really interesting what Angela um, put up there about roses and about weddings not actually requiring so many roses because of not the weddings. I would say we also need to educate um, our brides and grooms. I don't just want to presume it's the, the brides, um, but about the variety that we can provide um, from local sources as well. But people have a very fixed view quite often of the sort of things that they're looking for. The more that people see the alternatives, um, the more people are going for them. But I think working collaborative, that's why I've been really impressed by the work Flowers from the Farmer have been doing, because it is a members organisation with that. So I think that that needs to be explored more. And presumably a lot of that collaboration work would happen through Flowers on the Farm anyway, I'm guessing. I mean, whether there's a, you know, we're certainly, you know, neither the OGA or, us, or the Soil Association are trying to recreate another organisation, so, you know, is. Uh, so I'm, I'm guessing that some of that happens anyway through flowers for the farm does it or whether there's sort of many formal things i don't know but. there's no marketing co it's not nowhere near being a marketing cooperative um it's more of an awareness raising and professional uh, for people for people entering the industry it's great and for support and for um uh, raising consumer awareness it's brilliant it, um, I still think there could be something else additionally um, to do with actually selling, you know, collaborating on selling. I think that's almost a different thing. It, that is more of a cooperative or hub or whatever. Um, but there's no reason why, yeah, we have to duplicate the forums, really. Um, I, I, it must be very much like how Box Scheme started, like you said, Ben. That we must be following a similar pattern. Each flower variety is just a vegetable, really. <laughs> um, the, I don't think we're reinventing the wheel. Um, um, I think that we're just following probably a box scheme kind of model. But but Jim, are well, you still there, Jim? Because you, you you do that anyway, and and you're in flowers too. Is Jim around? I don't know, if Jim. I mean, I would. Uh, Jim yeah. come in as well. But you you there, Jim? Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. I'm on Haley's uh, link. Uh, sorry, what was the 
questioned when I was. <laughs> you weren't asleep then, were you, Jim? Um, it was really about how close to the box scheme model is if we were to look at collaborating more on selling the flower varieties through a kind of more of a cooperative or a hub or something. How close is that to, you know, the box scheme model? Can it be replicated into flowers, I suppose, is what I'm asking. Well, the box scheme we run is just our own produce for the veg, although we mm -hmm. started doing flowers with it. That yes. people have the option of getting flowers delivered. But box schemes can take lots of different models, uh, whether they're more one person running the box and buying in a lot. Some of them are at the consumer end. So there's certainly the possibility for growers together and deciding what type of model they want to run such a box scheme on, whether one grower is going to take it on all the box scheme delivery side of it or whether that should be a sort of separate enterprise not a grower but somebody specializing in it the marketing side working with a number of growers i think to make it work what it would mean is actual growers who want to be involved in it getting together looking at local circumstances in their own who's got the time who's got the energy uh, sort of what facilities uh, different people have got on access to markets and taking it from there, finding the actual business model, who's going to run it on a, subs on a weekly or fortnightly or occasional subscription basis. I think there's quite a possibility for that because we do have customers who get a bunch every week with their box we've now got at the market as well people who don't just hope we haven't run out but actually order bunches that are kept back for them and they've no idea what they're going to be in them until they see them so there is definitely potential for regular customers but yeah. the devil will be a bit in the detail but the growers can work that detail out by getting together and talking it over yeah and it Thanks, Jim. And there's, I mean, there are some comments from Harriet and Angela in the chat, which I, I think are pertinent as well. Uh, so one of them saying that the flowers from the farm tends to be very small growers supplying their own event floristry and the, a lot of the challenges in scaling up. And I would say in terms of that collaboration bit, I'm not convinced that box schemes are the best model. I think uh, often growers have found it hard to collaborate. And I don't know whether with the I don't want to be uh, stereotypical here, but with the majority of flower growers being women, it might be that you find it easier to collaborate than um, the male <laughs> counterparts who might be slightly more ego driven. I don't know, but um, so I think there are some really good things to learn from boxing. I think vegetable growers have tended to to find it hard to grow as well. So there are obviously some very successful examples like you know Riverford, or but equally there are a lot of small growers running their own box schemes and running themselves ragged over it um which is not necessarily the model to copy but um mm -hmm. we've got five five minutes left and i just i did want to just touch on it was brought up uh, a little bit in the questions that people submitted but the one of the things that seemed to happen with covid was that uh, some areas of the market actually did really well and, and the sort of home delivery or you know online sales obviously the, the wedding market dropped out and i just wondered again whether some of those opportunities uh has there been a permanent shift i guess in how people are buying flowers to uh, being much more willing to buy online or to subscribe you know has have people seen that and is that likely to be permanent in any way I can only speak from our own experience and, and having chatted with other growers. Um, if you already had an online presence, you were very lucky. 
uh, we were also very lucky. I think Angela, you who somebody was it Angela? You said you were the only supplier to a supermarket for three months. Well, we were really lucky to have Abel and Cole. We worked with Abel and Cole, and they honoured all of our flower growing. They 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 actually gifted our flowers for three months to their customers because they honoured our contract. So it does depend who you're working with as to how lucky you were. But we were really lucky that we were able to sell all our flowers. We could have sold them four times over um because we were online um people got used to buying things online and i don't think that will go away um it was also a lot easier to get their deliveries because they were all at home so that meant that our flowers were arriving and they were received they weren't left in the sun and they were um yeah they were really um it, it made it a lot easier people were a bit more forgiving as well um you know we didn't have to send out every day we could say we're only going in to send out um once a week so it you know it made things easier i i actually do think that um it has changed um patterns of buying definitely um and it has moved people more locally so i, I think covid although yes we've dropped all the events all the workshops all the weddings and that's awful for people who that was their business and it was many people's business um i think growers are quick to adapt and i think um the market has changed but it is still there uh, and even more so i think people wanted to use flowers to say i miss you um uh, weddings will change we think that weddings will become more personal more intimate they probably won't do as m many big budget weddings but that will suit small growers i think so uh, yeah there's definitely changes but we can adapt um we're good at that growers generally that's a good positive note <laughs> Jill, have you got anything you wanted to sort of add? I was, just going to, I was just going to add, I think another aspect of COVID has been that people have really been trying to support their local businesses more than people have done before. Some people always try to do that. However, people have been re restricted to local deliveries. Sorry, we're having a massive thunderstorm at the moment here. <laughs> um but people have been restricted to local deliveries so there's been more awareness of what is actually available locally to you and i think that again once people know that it's not going to go back and mm. and that feel of people being a bit more forgiving and people being a bit more you know collegial and working together a bit more i'm hoping will also um continue going forward um, one thing I did want to mention, we are continuing our work in East Africa because, of course, flower sales are a developmental thing as well. You know, there are a lot of people in different parts of the world that do rely on the trade. I think it can be done a lot safer and a lot better, um, but it's a case, I would say, of how these things can work together as well. Mm. And we are going forward. I hope you'll keep an eye on our research. Um, because we're looking particularly at the impact of COVID, both in terms of the UK supply. So we're going to be researching if that consumer demand does increase and stay. Um, we're working with supermarkets as well, looking at that. Um, but we're also looking on the ground in the remote places and, and flower growing, how to make them more um, resilient. Um, looking at building food um, gardens for flower farmers and, and very practical things for that as well. So I do want to mention mention that as well. But but otherwise, this has been a really fascinating discussion. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you both. Thank you, Joe and Jill, and obviously to Fiona for her her interview, which hopefully you will get to hear in due course. Uh, and thank you all for coming and for the great comments and questions in the chat. Uh, and hope we all get some rain. <laughs> yeah, we have it. That's right, you've already got it. <laughs> in buckets. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Good Bye. Night. Thank you. Bye.